Japan has always been my ultimate travel destination. When I was young, my love for Japanese cars and big futuristic cities led me to falling in love with Japan before I'd ever even been there. As I got older and became more interested in travel, food and culture, of course, Japan remained at the top of my list. What a cool experience. That's like ultimate bucket list there, ultimate. Over the next three weeks, we're going to be exploring Japan. We're renting a car and plan to aimlessly head out on the open road. There is no destination because of course, the journey is what's most important. The trip is off to a very irresponsible start. <laughs> it's like something out of a zombie movie or something like that. It's a very surreal feeling. We had an incredible time exploring Japan. There were some highs. Have fun. So good. So good. Highlights of the trip. One of the highlights of the trip for sure. It's just so nice to see them like this. There were definitely some lows. What is some? No, 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 no. We got screwed over by our hotel basically. Well, Kobe was awesome, except I'm not happy. And there were many incredible experiences that I'll remember for the rest of my life. So sit back, relax, and join us on this exciting adventure through Japan. There are 26 things I'm dying to do on this trip, and I've created the ultimate bucket list for this journey through Japan. So join us as we explore this incredible country. Our journey starts in Tokyo. Joining me on this trip is one of my closest mates, Dan the Man. Flying in from two different countries, we actually both landed just five minutes apart and met at the airport. How you doing, man? You good? What's up, man? I'm exhausted, man. <laughs> <laughs> How was your flight? Tiring, man. Long. Yeah. Long. That's two days of traveling. For us both to land at the same time, it meant taking crappy flights. My trip from Bangkok had a stop in Hong Kong, and Dan's was an overnight trip heading from LA. We both arrived at Tokyo just before 3 p.m., completely exhausted, jet lagged, and body clock completely out of whack. The first day was basically just a ride off. We checked into the hotel, went out for dinner, and crashed out early. The following morning, we woke up fully refreshed and ready for action. We have to go pick up our rental car and get everything we need ready in preparation for the next three weeks on the road. Only in Japan do you come to an underground mall to rent a car. Since this is our first time doing anything like this, it will definitely be a learning experience. I've never driven an electric car before. Oh, that's oh, so that's weird, freaky. right? <laughs> So we've got the car. This is very exciting. It's a big. It's been a learning process. I've never driven a, an electric car or a hybrid car before, but all good. We in just, Tokyo. In Tokyo, yeah. We just. Well, now we need to figure out the whole parking situation. So there's little parking stations everywhere, but the signs are mostly in Japanese. We went did a bit of a recon mission last night. You think we park at the hotel? I think we parked at the hotel. We'll try that, and maybe the hotel staff can help us. This, get, this, this entire trip is going to be full of challenges like this, mostly around language barrier. This is nothing in English. Not, not nothing thing. is in English. Which is great. Oh, no. as it should be. Yeah. It doesn't help a tourist. No, it's going to be a challenge for sure. So this car is a Nissan Note. It's a hybrid car, which we thought would be really fun. We wanted to get like a little boxy Japanese car to drive around the country and and since we're doing a whole lot of driving we thought a hybrid car would be really good it's really weird to drive though but it's nice inside right nice isn't this a soccer mom car it's it definitely them. a soccer mom car <laughs> <laughs> we've got the full insurance package no no excess smash the thing up <laughs> <laughs> giving us a bumper car through Tokyo <laughs> destruction take, derby take it back completely trash <laughs> thanks we had an awesome time <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
Dude. <laughs> So we think we have figured it out. The car is parked anyway. The challenge will be getting it out tomorrow morning, but that's it. The car is done. We have the rental car and tomorrow we'll hit the road. We spent the rest of the day exploring Tokyo before getting ready to set off on our road trip. We will be returning to Tokyo at the end of our trip, but before we head off on the open road, we wanted to have a couple of relaxed days of fun. Ready to begin our adventure, the first day of the road trip was here. Thankfully, we were able to figure out the parking station with not too much hassle and get out on the open road. Dan and I both love adventure and hate planning. We enjoy the journey more than the destination. However, we still need a destination. Well, we just started driving and I realized we have no idea where we're going. Fuck, we didn't put it <laughs> Uh, just aimlessly driving towards. We just go towards. Uh, so we are off on the road. The trip is off to a very irresponsible start. <laughs> <laughs> we know where we're going, kind of, but we have not booked a hotel. And if past experience told me anything, Japan is not the sort of country that you can just rock up to hotels and find a room. But that's exactly what we're going to try and do. For us, being on the road and catching up was half the fun. I love driving and rarely get to do it anymore, and to be exploring the country with a good mate, driving a silly little Japanese hybrid car was an absolute riot. So, we have decided to take a little detour. We were kind of near the coastline and I've wanted to check out a beach town. It's on my list of things to do. I don't think this is it, but we are at the beach, or at a beach. So let's check it out. So Japan does have some beautiful beaches. This is not one of them. Being an Australian, I'm not that impressed, but you said it's, oh, it's the best English beach I've <laughs> to. Good, good by English standards. <laughs> it's cold here though. No, it's warm by English standards. Oh, it's warm by English standards. Okay, okay. Well, these are some big waves. Damn, we might have to... Damn. <laughs> We're going to go. This... All right, let's what get out of here. While we didn't have a hotel booked, we had a general idea of where we wanted to go. I am yet to go up into the mountains of Japan, having only visited major cities, and I couldn't wait to see a new side to the country. As we got closer to our intended destination, I was greeted with a nice surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop, what oh. happened? Oh yeah, it looks Snow! I mean, I'm Australian, we don't see snow very often. Oh, that's amazing! Looks good. It's like a postcard. Yeah, it does. Ah, shit! <laughs> <laughs> yes! Yeah, so one of the things that was on my bucket list I really wanted to do was to come and stay up in the mountains. This hotel is based, it's a ski resort basically. I wasn't sure going into this trip if I'd see snow at all. I know I keep talking about this, but you have to understand, I've only seen snow about five times in my whole life. And I'm just, I'm so happy to be here. This is really cool. It's freezing here by the way, but ah man, I'm just, I'm so happy. So the position of this hotel is awesome. It's exactly what I wanted. We are right up. Check out that view. We are right up in the mountains. Medium size. Dan's very excited about the pajamas. Oh, Japanese pajamas are the best. <laughs> are they? Oh, like a, a robe, like a kimono. <laughs> oh, let's see. Oh, 
yes, this place is awesome. Check out this hotel room. Check out this view. I am really happy with this room. I honestly, I wasn't sure what to expect because I've been using sort of Japanese websites to try and find all these places. And when I was looking at this one, there wasn't actual pictures of the room and all the images were digitally generated images. So I wasn't sure what the place was actually going to look like. The next challenge was coming down here. Could we get a place without booking? And I really didn't know because I've had bad experience with this before here in Japan, but we were able to, we just rocked up and we were able to get a room and it was really reasonably priced. In the evening, we went into the town for dinner before hitting the games room in the hotel for some fun. What I'm sure you'll realize throughout this trip is Dan and I are very competitive and what started out as just a fun evening in the games room got quite serious. Good morning. We had an awesome stay up here in the mountains. It's actually really beautiful here this morning. It's a little more clear and I can see there's mountains on the other side of the lake that I didn't actually know were there yesterday. The sunset was so nice, but it kind of blocked that view. So we had a little bit of snowfall overnight and this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to be staying somewhere beautiful like this. So I've just been reviewing all the footage that we've been taking so far and this trip is off to an amazing start. This hotel, this experience, staying up in the mountains was exactly what I wanted. So time to cross another thing off the list. Oh, this is a fun list. Oh, cold. Cold, 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 cold. Cold! Ah, Mr. Daniel san, <laughs> your Uber has arrived. Yeah. Staying in the mountains and seeing the snow was definitely something that needed to be on my bucket list. However, the reason we stayed in these particular mountains was no coincidence. So this morning we are heading to Ebisu Circuit, which is about a 45 minute drive up in the mountains from where we stayed. And I'm so excited. I can't wait to get to this track. Ebisu Circuit is one of Japan's most iconic drift circuits. Nestled in the scenic hills of Nihonmatsu with multiple tracks spanning throughout the mountains. For me, being a Japanese car enthusiast, visiting here is not just a bucket list item for this trip, but for my life in general. あの、元々はね、あの、グラベルのコースだったんです。で、それをえ、カーバックに全部変えて、で、それからえっと、俺がドリフトが好きになってから、こういう峠コースを作ったり、いろんなコースを作りました。Oh, yes, we have arrived. Oh, it's freezing. Oh my god. Ebisu Circuit is closed over the winter, and there were no major events on during the time we were in Japan. However, the track had just reopened for free practice, and we came on the first weekend it was open. This is just so awesome. I was so excited to finally be in a place that I'd only seen in videos. Walking around, watching the drifting and checking out the cars, I was completely in my element. The local people were all really friendly to us and seemed to be happy to see a couple of foreigners just enjoying watching. I was having an amazing time just standing on the side of the track watching and then this happened. What is your name? Sekine. Sekine. Adam. 
Adam. Adam. Adam. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> ah. Oh my god, amazing! <laughs> <laughs> that was unbelievable. <laughs> so god, thank you so much. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> that was so cool. Thank you so much, thank you. Oh. Cool! <laughs> Sure. Unbelievably fun. You get flung all over the car. It's so sick. I was just like smiling and laughing the whole time. Ah, that's like ultimate bucket list there. Ultimate. Amazing. I'm ready to go home. I can go back. <laughs> we can leave. As much as I wanted to see the cars and see all the drifting, I was also very interested in the famous graveyard. This is an area where some people store their cars while others have left them basically to rot away and die. <laughs> I can't believe this place even exists. I'm like a kid in a candy store here. All my dream cars are in this one place. Some of them have been left for dead. A lot of, I think a lot of them are for sale, but it looks like some have been sitting here for years, just rotting away. There's a $100,000 RX-7 that I would kill for. Covered in mold, it's unbelievable. Yes. So much fun. I need to cross this off my list. After an incredible day at Ebisu Circuit, and one I'll remember forever, we made our way to Fukushima. This is a prefecture I've always wanted to explore. We arrived in the evening, checked out some of the local bars, had a few very competitive games of darts, and ended up meeting some locals that took us out for a night of fun, bouncing from bar to bar in their nightlife district. Morning. Morning. How are you feeling? Good. Good? Good. I'm feeling better. <laughs> Been worse. <laughs> Been better. In March 2011, Fukushima experienced a magnitude 9 earthquake just off the coast, causing a 15 meter high tsunami, destroying coastal areas and causing a meltdown at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The tsunami took nearly 20,000 lives, and because of the nuclear meltdown, 150,000 people needed to be relocated. Many parts of Fukushima remain abandoned and many areas are still forbidden to enter. Today we've come to what's left of the remains of the Ukedo Elementary School here in Fukushima. This is in the town of Nami, and it's very eerie walking around in here. This is one of the few surviving buildings in the area. Pretty much everything has been wiped out. We're about a couple hundred meters back from the seawall, and this building was actually hit with a 15 meter tall wall of water basically and it's taken out everything in this area yet this building remains taking a walk around here is very eerie it's crazy to see these rooms just completely destroyed the wall of water actually went up to above the second floor here so you can see the classrooms and everything around here is just completely destroyed Just behind me here, what looks like an empty field was all once houses completely wiped out by the tsunami and everywhere we've been driving along here, there was little towns and there's no sign of them anymore. It's basically just abandoned emptiness like this. An exclusion zone of a 20 kilometer radius around the power plant was created. And while a lot of these areas are now open and deemed safe to live, 
many of the towns are still completely abandoned. So this behind me here is the end of the line basically. This is where the exclusion zone starts. This is as far south as we can get along the coastline and the nuclear power plant is actually not too far behind us here. So we're just doing some driving up and down this coast, exploring. And we want to head to some abandoned towns if we can find them too. We have come to the seawall. Basically, this is where the tsunami came in, 15 meters tall. It is freezing here, by the way. Loving the weather. <laughs> Far out, it's cold. But basically, this is the end. This is a sign on the ground saying, don't go beyond this point, basically. And you can see this building, I think, is quite famous. I've seen it in a few videos. It's still standing, but quite destroyed. Oh my God, it's cold. Walking down these streets is quite surreal and there's definitely a very post-apocalyptic feeling in these towns. Man, it is so weird to be in a whole town that's basically abandoned. It feels like, it feels like something out of a zombie movie or something like that. It's a very surreal feeling. This is wild. So we've come into what looks like an old bar or restaurant. There's a house behind, but this is this area here. So there's a bar fridge and this looks like a bar here. So interesting. We both love exploring, especially abandoned places and things like this. So super interesting. So Titanic. Titanic box set. And uh, is that a porno? Cindy, Cindy Crawford, Cindy Crawford shape your body workout. To us, the most fascinating thing about visiting here is that, true to Japanese culture, people have left everything completely untouched. The homes have not been looted, and we could even still see items of value in the houses we explored. So we have found a little town that is completely abandoned. Spooky, huh? Yeah, nature's taken back over as well. Yeah, really, yeah. This is wild. There are huge works underway to restore these coastal towns. And as you get further away from the center of the exclusion zone, Fukushima is a beautiful and exciting prefecture. Fukushima is Japan's third largest prefecture and one of three main ramen capitals in Japan. You can't come to Japan and not eat ramen, so of course, that's on my list. Today, we're in the town of Kitakata, the ramen capital of Japan. We're gonna be visiting a famous ramen restaurant here, but first, this is a ramen shrine behind us. In Kitakata, the ramen shrine we visited was also famous for selling ramen flavored ice cream, which sounded very strange to us, but we were very intrigued to try. So we are starting off with something a little weird. This is ramen ice cream. Mm. Is it ramen flavor? Ramen flavor ice cream. It's even got like a little spring onion on it. <laughs> this looks amazing. I love it. Oh, it's nice. That's weird. It's, it's weird, but it's nice. It does taste a little bit like ramen, but it does still taste like ice cream. So she gave us black pepper with it to try. It's good. She knows. It's a really unusual taste. I like it with the black pepper almost like brings it like something, a little like kick to the ice cream. Mm. It's good, it's good, really good. I like it. Good breakfast. Okay, thank you. I think it's a Alright, well that was fun. Now we're off to a proper ramen restaurant. That was good. Yeah. Starting with ice cream, I like it. Yeah. 
just behind me is a shop called Ramen Ipe and this place is famous for opening up at 7 a.m. which is not typical for ramen stores here in Japan. The staff arrive here at 4 a.m. to prepare everything for the 7 a.m. opening time. In the town there are a lot of factory workers and many of them work overnight shifts. Kitakata is one of Japan's most famous ramen towns with the most ramen shops per capita in the world and this restaurant was a must visit. Oh my god. Good. Oh, that's amazing. So much flavor. That is just amazing. The ramen itself is delicious, but the broth is just so packed full of flavor. At this restaurant, one of the reasons the ramen is so good is they grind pork fat into the broth and then add it again individually to each dish. So here you are supposed to slurp your noodles as well. It's a sign of respect to the chef, showing that it's so delicious you can't help yourself. The loud slurping is a compliment. The food on this trip has been nothing short of spectacular and we are thoroughly enjoying eating our way around this country. Oh man, Fukushima. It's been awesome. From Fukushima, we headed north to the city of Sendai where we spent a couple of days taking a break from the travel. Okay. Uh, regular, uh, full. Yeah, yeah. So this is our first time stopping to fill up the car with fuel. We've been driving for like three days, right? On yeah. the first tank. And it's only a small tank. So we just paid 4,900 yen and we got 27 liters. So it's only a 30 odd liter tank. So a full tank does uh, 600 miles, kilometers. Mm. So we got 600 kilometers out of 27 liters. That's amazing. That's why we chose this car to drive around the country. In, in Sendai, we played approximately 13,000 games of darts and tried to drink every last drop of alcohol in the city. <laughs> got him. We even met some more locals that took us out for a couple of nights of fun on the town. Currently, we are one week into the trip and having an incredible time exploring the beautiful country of Japan. I'm hammering through my bucket list, adding new items to it, but also having fun and creating amazing memories off camera. <laughs> Today is a day that it's, it's a freezing day. It's a day that we are on the road doing some exploring and there's a whole bunch of towns that we wanted to stop off at along the way. This is Ginzan Onsen, which is a really traditional town. It's a hot spring town and it's so beautiful here. All the driving we've been doing through the snow covered mountains. It's just been really scenic and really incredible to experience. And I love when you come to a place like this, seeing the traditional architecture and of course being covered in snow is a really nice bonus. Ginzan Onsen, the picturesque hot spring town of Yamagata Prefecture, is famous for the historic buildings and of course the natural hot springs, which flow from deep underground, drawing visitors seeking relaxation and rejuvenation in mineral rich waters. Oh, that's so hot. Oh, that's so hot. Oh, is it? It's this one the hottest. Oh, yeah, it's much nicer. So visiting a hot spring is something I definitely wanted to do on my bucket list, something I must do. However, it's quite challenging because Dan is covered in tattoos. Can't, can't go to the onsen, can we? Yeah, it's because of the uh, old Yakuza, the gangster. And it would have been, people with tattoos were not welcome because they wouldn't have been very pleasant. <laughs> so people didn't right, want right, to be right. like around them. We're trying to keep, keep people tradition. like you out. Keep people like me out. <laughs> Oh, it's just started snowing. I don't know if you can see. What a cool experience. Oh, this is awesome. Visiting a hot spring outside in the snow is something I've always wanted to do. The challenges for this trip are not just that Dan's completely covered in tattoos, but even if I went to a traditional one alone, you can't wear clothes in them, so I wouldn't be able to film it anyway. So this is about as close as we will get, but I'll take it. Oh man, that was awesome. That town is so pretty. Time to cross another one off the list. Japan is famous for many different things. One of them is alcohol. And while I'm definitely no stranger to a drink, this is a foreign concept to me. 
Today we've come to do something that you can only do in Japan. These are sake vending machines behind me here and the way it works is you get a little cup, you exchange money for tokens and then you put it in the machine and out comes your sake. Sake or Japanese rice wine is a traditional alcoholic beverage made from fermented rice. Sake can vary in flavor and aroma. Sake plays a deep role in Japanese culture, from breaking down walls when meeting people, celebrations, to showing your trust in someone by sharing your sake together. Cheers. Cheers. Kanpai. Kanpai. One shot. <laughs> strong. Strong. <laughs> Tastes alright. Really tasty. Strong. Smooth though. Mm. Down the hatch. Just a few hours from the hot spring is Niigata City, where we had found out there was a sake vending machine in town, so obviously we made the trip down. We spent one fun night in Niigata before continuing down the west coast. Right now we are heading south to a town called Kanazawa. This is a city that really appealed to us because it's famous for being a samurai town. The samurai were elite warriors in feudal Japan, serving noble families from the 12th to the 19th century. They followed the Bushido code, emphasizing loyalty, honor, and self-discipline. They wielded katana swords and played a significant role in Japanese society and warfare. We will begin here at the Kanazawa Castle. This place is being completely reserved and it's really beautiful to take a walk around here. After that, we're going to check out some of the local towns and some of the more traditional areas and explore the history of the samurai here in Kanazawa. I love coming to visit places like this. It's so beautiful here. And to add to it, we've got a really nice day. It's a lovely afternoon. We've had some crappy weather for the last few days, but this is, oh, this is amazing. Kanazawa, located in Ishika Prefecture, has historical significance in samurai history, as it was the seat of power for the Maeda clan during the Edo period. The Maeda clan were powerful feudal lords known as the Daimyo, and the samurai were influential in shaping the region's culture and history. Kanazawa has preserved some samurai districts and the Kenrokuin Garden, once the Maeda clan's private garden. This is the Nagamachi Samurai House District, and this is a really beautiful traditional part of town. Actually visiting a traditional town is on my bucket list, but this is not the place that we're going to be doing that. That's actually coming up tomorrow. This area is a traditional samurai town that has all been preserved in its original condition and it's just so beautiful walking around through here. What are we doing, Dan? Looking for a samurai sword and a samurai umbrella. <laughs> This material is zinc alloy, not sharp. Okay, okay. Mm, that weight is the same as we are one, about yeah. 1.2 kilograms. Is okay. Old. It's feeling dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cute. So same weight? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. But not this is the samurai family is female. Oh, the female <laughs> yeah, family? Yeah. Oh, mm. I like it though. Mm. You gonna get one? Yeah. What one do you think? One of these? The girls one? Yeah, small girl. <laughs> this is cool. I like this, but then I like the gold on this. <laughs> I wasn't going to buy a sword, but Dan was buying a sword and I got jealous, so <laughs> I think I got to get one too. Sword envy. <laughs> After Dan bought his sword, I figured I have to have one as well. It's a great souvenir to bring home from Japan. So I got the middle size one because I'm going to need to take it back on the plane. So I figured that one will fit in my suitcase. I hope if it doesn't, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's definitely not carry on. Ooh, I have a bad feeling about this. Uh-oh. Hopefully I can get it to... I'll have to take it out of the box. Hopefully I can get it like this. Oh god. It's gonna be close. Oh! Just. Oh, thank god. 
I really wasn't sure if that was going to fit. On my bucket list was visiting a traditional Japanese town and as we make our way down south, Kyoto was the obvious choice. I was also hoping to catch the cherry blossom while I'm here, but it looks like there's still a few weeks off. But I will see it before the end of the trip. Kyoto is famous for its temples and shrines, which we will visit, but it's also well known for preserving the older buildings and keeping the traditional styling throughout parts of the city. Taking a walk through here is like going back in time. So this is what I really enjoy doing when I travel, is to just walk around and take a look at the streets, look at the buildings, the architecture, everything. I mean, look how, look how beautiful this is. This is the one. I want to make my house just like this. I want to live here. Kyoto, which actually used to be Japan's capital, is one of those cities that you can just get lost in, wandering around, taking in the sights. What I find quite funny is that it's fun to walk around here all day looking at just looking at the houses and if you tried to do something like that in a small town in Australia, well, <laughs> you'd be quite disappointed. There is a certain calmness to Kyoto that is a real part of its charm. Dan and I wandered around the streets for a few hours before heading to our hotel to check in to get ready for a night of fun. So, also in Kyoto, I'm going to be ticking one more thing off the bucket list. This is something I've always wanted to do. I don't really know how I'm going to do this. This is Pachinko. And Pachinko, we can't actually really take a camera in here, but I'm going to be taking my tiny little DJI in. And hopefully, we can get away with it. Pachinko is a Japanese game that is essentially the mix of an arcade game and a poker machine. It's a massive obsession in Japan. There are over 2.2 million pachinko machines all across the country and some parlors having up to 1,000 machines inside. Money is exchanged for small balls that you play through the machine. When you get the balls into certain holes, you're rewarded with more balls, which you can continue to play or exchange for prizes. I don't really know what's happening, but I'm winning little balls, they just keep coming out. Gambling is actually illegal in Japan, so you cannot exchange the balls for money. However, you can cross the street and find a shop that will be willing to buy your prize ticket from you for a cash amount. This is the loophole that ensures Pachinko is not breaking any laws, I guess. What do you think, Dan? I wanted to love it. <laughs> but it's a bit weird. I don't have a clue what's going on. <laughs> not a clue. Not a clue. We didn't really have any idea what we were doing, and it turns out we weren't that great at it. I exchanged around $10 and got to play for around 30 minutes. I won the small prizes many times, but never the bigger jackpots. <laughs> oh, dude, that was fun. You enjoyed? No. Uh, kind of? Yeah, I did, I did, I did. Quickest way to lose $10. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it wasn't that quick. It went for... We were there for oh, quite a oh, while. Machine. I'm just rubbish at it. It's something we've both wanted to do, because we've yeah. always, always seen it, been really intrigued. No idea what... Still no yeah, idea. I'm going to do it again. You gonna do it again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we'll do it again in Tokyo. Tokyo. In Tokyo, awesome! So much fun. We're spending two nights in Kyoto because it's a really beautiful city, and there's still a few things on my bucket list to check off here. Okay, this might not be for everyone, but this is definitely a bucket list item for me. I'll keep the segment quick for you.
This place is called AE86 Special Shop. And why have I bought you to a dealership that sells 1980s Toyotas? Well, this place is actually quite special. The 1986 Toyota Corolla, as it was called here, also called the Toyota Sprinter, was made famous from a Japanese anime, Initial D. Initial D started off as a manga comic in 1995 before becoming an animated series in 1998. While I do enjoy the odd anime, it's not something I watch often, but anyone that has a passion for Japanese cars has watched Initial D. I put Dan onto the anime last night. What yeah. do you think? Love it. Now, I want one. Tofu store, right? Eh? Yeah, tofu store. <laughs> Recently, these cars have become a real collector's item in places like Australia or America. They're really hard to come by. An example of one of these in Australia probably goes for around fifty-five to sixty-five thousand dollars, which seems crazy. There was a point in time these cars were undesirable shit boxes, but. They've since grown a cult following and to see this many looking like this all in one place is just, it's mind blowing to me. Dan has been very patient with me taking him to all these weird spots along the way, but I promised him I'd make it up to him because I had a great afternoon planned somewhere special. Now, when I think of Kyoto, I think of beautiful traditional houses and temples and shrines. We've come to one of the most famous ones. I've actually come on a Sunday for some reason, and it seems like the whole rest of Kyoto is here as well, but we're still gonna check it out. Fushimi Inari Taisha is a Shinto shrine located in Kyoto. It was founded all the way back in 711 AD and is dedicated to Inari, the Shinto god of rice, prosperity, and business. The shrine is famous for its thousands of vibrant orange torii gates that form winding paths up the sacred Mount Inari. So these gates are known as torii and they mark the significance of passing through from the real world into the realm of the gods. It's really beautiful here but it's super busy. But every now and then you get lucky and there's no one around and you get a little pocket to yourself. There are around 80,000 Shinto shrines throughout Japan, ranging from small local shrines to larger ones like this one. These shrines play a significant role in Japanese culture and spirituality, serving as a place of worship, cultural heritage, and community gatherings. This one here in Kyoto is a sight to behold. That's just so beautiful here. Everything looks like a movie or an anime or something, if you see the characters on the fence here is really beautiful. I'm loving all of this. We spent the rest of the afternoon wandering around Kyoto, taking in the sights and continuing to eat as much amazing food as humanly possible. Ah oh man, Kyoto has been a real success and I am, oh I'm so excited for what we've got coming up still. What's up, but a morning to you. Good morning. Excited for Kobe? Yeah. Looking for some booze, booze. So today we are off to Kobe and we are going to Kobe for one reason <laughs> and one reason only. Kobe was a must visit town for us. And while we didn't know much about Kobe at all, the city is famous all across the world and we knew the most important thing. So the reason that we have come to Kobe is to eat, basically. Kobe beef, I've only had once before and I'm dying to try it here. And of course, we had to come to Kobe to try the best. Kobe is famous for its exceptionally high quality beef. The marbling and tenderness make this often considered the highest quality beef in the world. And tonight, we are visiting a restaurant that's been highly recommended to us. Kobe beef is not just any cattle from Kobe. There are specific requirements and each restaurant must have a license to say that they are eligible to cook the highest quality beef.
Kobe comes from a specific breed of Wagyu cattle raised in the Hyogo prefecture. These cattle are pampered with a special diet, strict regulations and even massage regularly to ensure the meat's unparalleled taste, tenderness and rich flavour. Thank you Ben. My mouth is watering so much. <laughs> The intricate marbling of the fat throughout the meat contributes to its buttery texture and melt-in-your-mouth sensation, making Kobe beef a highly sought-after delicacy. We have two different types of beef to try. This last one that we're having is the sirloin. That's just... It's unbelievable. It's worth the money. Oh, man. Amazing. You satisfied? Satisfied. By far, it's easily the most beautiful meat I've ever eaten. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I think so. The flavor is just amazing. How soft and tender it is, it's just on another level. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God, that was amazing. Check that off the list. Kobe beef definitely isn't cheap and the meal ran us both about $200 each, but it was definitely worth it to have an incredible meal and for the experience. After our meal, Dan and I hit the town for some beers and of course, more darts. Well, Kobe was awesome, except I'm not happy. Last night I had my ass handed to me in darts. Dan was, Dan was on fire. Fire last night. Six bullseyes in a row. Right? Six bullseyes in a row. That's right. After an amazing and expensive time in Kobe, we made our way to Osaka, my favorite city in Japan. We are in Osaka now, just reviewing all the footage from Kobe. We had an amazing time there. But we had our first real kind of issue, I guess. It's been really smooth sailing up until now. But when we were leaving Kobe, we got screwed over by our hotel, basically. That wasn't entirely their fault. So our hotel gave us a map of where to park and it's all in Japanese. And they, they recommended a place for us to park that had cheap parking. Right next to the car park is another car park that we weren't supposed to park in. It's short term parking only. So when we went to go get the car the following morning, we were hit with a $171 bill for parking overnight, as opposed to $20 what we were expecting. Well, we f***ed up and parked in the wrong car park last night. This is how much? $171 to park overnight. Savage. Big mistake. Anyway, even with that, Kobe was amazing. It was just an expensive couple of days, but all good. Still getting through this list and still having a bunch of fun. Today we are in Shinsekai in Osaka and there's something really special here that I'm dying to tick off my bucket list. Shinsekai is a district full of restaurants, bars, shops, gaming, everything is here and it's complete madness. Now, being the fact that I was a kid that grew up in the 90s and loving the feeling of nostalgia, something I had to do on this trip was to come and visit a retro video game store. Today in the Shinsekai district, we've come to a retro games arcade that has all the games, the classics that you used to play, a whole bunch of games you've never even heard of. And this is just, it's like going back in time. It's amazing. In my childhood, video games were a very new thing and all these original games have made a real resurgence. Original console games are now becoming collector's items and this arcade has all the classics from the 80s and 90s. Good. Oh, just doing all the cheats I know, you know? 1989 me. So as a kid, I wasn't a huge gamer or anything like that, but I just find all this, all this stuff really cool. I had the original Nintendo. I never had a Super Nintendo, I had a Sega Mega Drive, a Sega Master System. Oh God, I gotta dig back, way back in the memory, PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2. But it's just so cool to see all these old games you haven't played in years and years. The original Mario Brothers, Street Fighter. I don't even know what half these games are, but it's so much fun. Oh, 
Oh, I can still like talk him. <laughs> So funny, I haven't played this in years. Like, I couldn't even tell you the last time I played this. You still remember where all the cheats and everything are. So much fun. Have fun. So good, so good. Highlights of the trip, one of the highlights of the trip for sure. Bro, oh, I don't remember this one. No, I don't remember that either. It's the first maker this thing, This is it, right? Super family family yeah. yeah, this is it. Must never seen like three Nintendos. Yeah. Well, it didn't come out in the West, maybe. This is what the first Nintendo looked like before they repackaged it as the NES. Oh, right, I didn't know that. The red one. So, continuing on with this theme, just nearby is a retro game store, and they sell everything here from old games, old consoles. This is just... Step back in time. It's amazing. Super Nintendo games along here. So cool. Game. Controllers. Oh, the gun? I never had this. Really cool. So unfortunately, I didn't see anything that I really wanted. I was hoping to get a Game Boy or something like that. I'm going to be making a studio space soon in Bangkok. I thought a retro video game console from here would be really cool. But they only had one Game Boy. It was like 300 bucks, so I can actually get it cheaper in Thailand. But it's so cool to walk around and see this anyway. We spent a total of three days in Osaka, hanging out and having fun and taking a break from filming. As I mentioned earlier, Osaka is my favorite city in Japan, so it was nice to take a break from the fast-paced trip and just have some fun. We are back on the road today, heading to a town called Nara, which I'm really excited about. There's two things that I want to do in Nara, and I think one of them is going to be a real highlight. What is some no 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 this is this is not good Oh that's the car park Ah all good where we parked the car I thought what I'm looking for wasn't here but that's just the car park I think what we found or what we need is up ahead Well, what a disappointment. So this area that you see behind me just here is or used to be an abandoned theme park. And this is one of the most famous ones in Japan that I've been able to come across. And it looked amazing. I was dying to come here and check it out, but it looks like it's all been flattened. Nara Dreamland opened in 1961 and ran until 2006. It was reported to be demolished in 2016, however videos and photos kept showing up online of an abandoned amusement park, leading it to become an attraction for urban explorers. I'm really confused by this because I'd seen a YouTube video from a guy that explored this like six months ago and I've just jumped back on because that place looks like it's been flattened for a really, really long time. So I'm just doing a little more research now. I'm checking I'm in the right place. I think I am. Okay, I've been doing a bit of reading and looking at the video. What I think has happened is this person's reposted an old video or used old footage or whatever to, to tell the story. So unfortunately, it looks like this place has actually been knocked down for a really long time. I was really looking forward to this. I thought this was going to be a real highlight of the trip. Damn. Oh man, this sucks. 
Anyway, there is something else I wanted to do in Naro. Let's go do that. With fresh feelings of defeat from the amusement park, I'm keen to turn this day around. So we've come to Nara Park, and this isn't just any old park, there's something really special here. There are around 1400 deer living in Nara Park and the surrounding areas. Deer are sacred animals here, and legend has it these deer are protected messengers of the gods. I just bought some biscuits to feed the deer, so I think, I don't know if they're trained or they just know to do it, but they'll bow to you before you feed them. I think, we'll see. Feed them more biscuits. It's all right. Yeah, I'm quite hungry myself. <laughs> They're so lovely. So I first discovered this place a year ago and I didn't know that there was live deer here. I just came down thinking it was a regular park. I was pleasantly surprised to see them here. Last year was a lot quieter and it was much easier to feed them. They're all running towards me to get the biscuits. I think this year there's a lot more people here so they're not as keen for it. It's just so nice to see them like this. I love animals and being outdoors in parks, so I really enjoyed the day just wandering around and hanging out with the deer. I was disappointed about the amusement park not being there, but it ended up being a great day. So yesterday in Osaka, we did the retro video games, which was a whole lot of fun, but I actually had one more thing that I wanted to do there. I wanted to do the Super Mario Kart experience and unfortunately, we weren't able to do it. So unfortunately Dan didn't meet the requirements with his licensing or whatever the issue was and I didn't want to do it without him so we scrapped that one but in two days I've missed two off the bucket list that I have to do next time. We spent one night at a small town near Nara before heading back on the road. We were treated to amazing weather and a very spectacular view. Well, good morning from Kawaguchiko. We came here for two reasons. Number one, to see Mount Fuji, which is just here. And number two, to visit a convenience store for breakfast. And we thought, what better convenience store than Japan's most famous? However, it seems like there's like a million people here today for some reason. This is ridiculous. <laughs> There is literally bus loads of people here. This is, it's a joke, honestly. Not what I was expecting at all. One of the things on my bucket list is to have breakfast at a convenience store. This particular Lawson is really famous for having Mount Fuji in the background and it's often shown in movies and anime. I was not expecting it to be anywhere near this busy. So we decided to skip it for now. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> Hilarious. So we took the drive around to Lake Kawaguchiko because the view of Mount Fuji from here is epic. Look at that. Mount Fuji truly is a sight to behold. Japan's largest peak at nearly 4,000 meters and is still an active volcano. We got lucky with the amazing weather, so decided to take a drive up for a closer look. Fuck. 
Wasn't expecting that, driving up to Mount Fuji and a deer ran out in front of the car. I might have to slow down a little. We spent the afternoon driving and walking around parts of the mountain before heading back out on the road, heading to somewhere I was really excited to visit. Good morning from a small town called Numazu, and this wasn't part of my original plan, but we're staying at a little beach house here. And I have to show you this because it's unbelievably cute. Come in and check it out. This is a really cute little traditional style Japanese house. This was my room last night. I stayed on little futons, but I actually put them all out and it was quite comfortable. The room itself is lovely. There's a beautiful painting on the wall here. Really nice little attention to detail in all these things. And as we come up here, there's an upstairs. This was Dan's room and again, a traditional Japanese style. I just love all this stuff. It's so beautiful. And we didn't know that we were going to be staying in a place like this when we came here. It just happened to be like this. This is really cool. A little sunroom here. There's all these bizarre rooms off the main part of the house that we just kept discovering. There's little doorways everywhere. A little room here. This is a little dining room, I guess. This is all lovely. It's all wood everywhere. It actually smells like a sauna in here. It's quite nice. Unbelievably random. And as I mentioned, we're at a beach town. So I'll show you around there as well, because that is on my list. Now, when you think of Japan, the beach might not be the first thing that comes to mind, but here we are. This is Atami Beach, a little over an hour out of Tokyo. It's a popular getaway full of hotels and resorts on the seaside. There's even a little surfing nearby, but the day we were there had next to no swell. Japan actually has some incredibly beautiful beaches and islands, especially in the south. And while we won't make it this time, I still wanted to see a beach town. Gosh, it's so easy to forget that you're in Japan as we walk along here. Just as we were driving down the hill to come in here, you could still see Mount Fuji. And now we come here, you could be anywhere in the world right now. It's so nice. I get vibes of being in Australia, being here down at the marina, seeing all the birds. Lovely. What we came to realize on this trip is we won't get to see the whole country in the time we have here. So, we are already starting to plan our next trip to Japan. So, welcome to Tokyo, welcome to a love hotel. Now, if you've caught a glimpse at my bucket list at any stage, I've been trying to keep quite secretive with it, but one of the things on there is to stay in a love hotel. And since we're in Tokyo, I mean, look at this place. It's insane. Love hotels are all over Japan, and the reason they exist is in traditional Japanese culture, people live with their family, typically until they marry. So living with your family makes it hard to have any intimate time with your partner. These hotels are all available for short use as well as overnight stays. Now there's all different types of love hotels that you can stay at here in Japan. This one is themed, it's kind of like a karaoke room. Some of them have very extravagant theming. Some hotels have individual rooms, will have all different concepts for each room. They're often actually quite large. This one is on the smaller end, but it's also on the cheaper end. Love hotels are all about discretion. When booking, you can use a vending machine instead of talking to anyone. They don't ask for your details or any identification. And when you pick up the keys at reception, the window is blocked with a reflective glass screen so that you cannot be seen by the staff working there. If you choose to park in the car park, you can also cover your number plate so that people can't see your car and recognize you there. So this one is set up like this is the bed here and then this is all kind of couches around 
This one is like an entry level room, I think. So if you're not super close with someone, you can come to one of these and it's a karaoke room that has a bed basically. So this is all couch up the back here. There's couch on the side. There is a giant television that has a whole bunch of TV stations, movies on demand, there's games, there's karaoke, there's a whole lot of adult entertainment on there and it's all part of the hotel package. It's all included in the rate. These love hotels are designed to have everything that you would need inside. Most people that use them don't bring luggage, so the rooms are equipped with everything that you would need, so you don't need to bring anything with you. So this hotel was around $100 a night, and to put that into perspective for the other hotels, if you wanted to stay at a regular business hotel, you're looking at around $250 a night to stay within this area on a weekend, so these are often a much cheaper option, and the rooms are kind of cool. There are booklets and magazines here that, as you take a look through, they have, they have all sorts of things available. This area that we're staying is in Kabukicho, which is kind of like a red light district. It's not really a red light district, but it's quite fascinating. There's a lot of host and hostess bars here. And while I don't really understand exactly what's going on in there, the whole subculture is very fascinating. So I guess the most important question is, how's the bed? It's good. It's probably got a bit of mileage on it, but hey, so do I. <laughs> All right, good morning. So today I am out to get a little redemption on a previously failed mission, convenience store breakfast. Everywhere you go in Japan, there are convenience stores, and it's not uncommon for Japanese people to even have meals in there. True to Japanese ways, they like to hang on to traditions, so you'll always see things like magazines, comics, and photocopiers inside. Okay, let's take a look at the fridge. We've got all juices and everything here. Coffee. I'm not much of a coffee drinker. Some fresh fruit, mandarin orange jelly, fresh fruit up here, yogurts, cakes, sweet things. Oh, I love all this. Yum. Not for breakfast. And we've got meats by the looks of it. These are, that's fish, more fish, grilled pork, fried chicken skin, everything here. And eggs. You want to make your food, make a salad. You got cabbage here. You got chicken here for the salad. Salad dressing, salad sauces, ham, bacon, and then we're starting to get into the microwave food section. Noodle dishes here. A whole bunch of microwave options. Some soups. Ooh, I might have a soup actually. That sounds good. Now we're in the sandwich section. You got burritos up here. Some more juices, sandwiches. Look at this one. Strawberries, custard, and whipped cream sandwich. No, thank you. And then you can see here, there's lots of different noodle and microwave options. Over a little more, we've got small salads, pickled vegetables, some salad dressings, cherry tomatoes, and then even more microwave food. There's a whole section here of different rice bowls, rice bowl with pork and garlic. One of the things I love about here as well is they've got hot food. Check this out. Pork buns, fried chicken, sausages, curry bread. These are delicious. So many different things to try. Okay, I'm gonna go with this. Soup with chicken, green onion, and pearl barley. I don't really know what any of this is. I'm just gonna look at the pictures and hope for the best. Lemon salad. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the cool things about the convenience stores here is you can sit inside and eat your food. So I ended up getting that soup and a, what I think is a mango passion fruit juice. Well, I'm not gonna lie, that was way better than I was expecting. All right, well, it is time to tick one more off the list. However, yesterday, I had another failed mission. So one of the things on my bucket list was to attend a car meet here. I did it last year and it was a really cool experience. 
Yesterday was the day we were going to go do it, and unfortunately, it got rained out. It was just raining really, really hard. And given that I leave in a few days, I'm not actually going to get this one done. So, another fail, and another one to add on the list for next year. We are on the final leg of our journey now, back to Tokyo for five days before wrapping up the trip. We had to bid farewell to our trusty Nissan Note that we'd put almost 3,000 kilometers on and prepare for a few fun days in Tokyo. Thank you, bye bye. All right, drop the car off. All good, no extra fees. Kind of, just a shitload of tolls. You hungry? Starving. So one of the things on my bucket list was to eat sushi. Of course, you have to eat sushi in Japan. And we did, we ate at this place, Kara, which was amazing. However, we couldn't actually film it because thanks to some idiot that decided it'd be a fun idea to lick a soy sauce bottle and post it on social media. Now they don't let anyone film inside. Anyway, we did eat sushi and it was amazing. We are flying through this list, getting down to the fun ones. There is three left and tonight we're going to do two of them. So first up is baseball. Now you might not think of baseball when you think of Japan, but baseball is Japan's most popular sport. Baseball has actually become Japan's national sport. Its ever-growing popularity is very apparent across the country. When we were in Japan last year, they won the World Series against America and it was a huge day for Japanese people. Not only do they have a highly competitive local league, but many Japanese players have also been drafted to the United States to play Major League. It seems everywhere you go in Japan there's a baseball field, but there's also baseball cages everywhere and all throughout the city. This is going to be a whole lot of fun. Alright, here we go. I'm not supposed to have the camera in here, but whatever. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, yeah, good one. Use that one. Oh man, that is so much fun. It's much harder than you think. Much like everything else here in Japan, you pay at a vending machine and the equipment is all included. We paid around $10 and got 60 balls. These cages are all super popular and a whole lot of fun. And what do you know? Dan and I got competitive again. So nice when you hit it like how you supposed to. Time for a beer, I think. <laughs> that was fun. What did you think? Exhausting. <laughs> right? I'm so bad at it. <laughs> it's hard, dude. Like, I never played. Did you play baseball at school? We never played baseball. We don't have Australia. baseball in England, yeah, no. Yeah. We don't in Australia, so I'd never played. We played cricket, but it's like quite different, but it's a whole lot of fun. I think when they see two Westerners in there, they're like, two Americans, are they going to be really good? Yeah, yeah. I'm, wearing, I'm wearing like a Dodgers hat. <laughs> I've got like a Nashville like hat, like a local one. They're like, oh yeah, these guys, they play ball. They know what they're doing. They know, we definitely don't know what we're we... doing. <laughs> I think they soon saw. Yeah. Yeah, good fun. I liked it. So after all that physical activity and sport, it's time for a beer. So we have come to the Golden Guy, which is a little network of hidden bars. It's like a maze in here and there's thousands of bars here. So these are all small bars that sit around four or five people. The thing is, when you go in, it's full commitment. You can see the stairs behind me here. You have no idea how many people are inside, if it's full, if you can get a seat. So you need to just kind of go for it. After you, Dan. One, two, three. <laughs> 
The way these small bars work is you can go in and if there's anyone else in the bar, you can all chat together. The only thing is, if the bar is full or doesn't look like your style, when you walk in, everyone turns around and looks at you and then you need to do the awkward walk out. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Ah, oh, that was fun. On to the next. We bounced around several of the bars in here. We'd visited this last bar on our previous trip. This one, everyone writes on money and sticks it on the walls or roof. We enjoyed a local Japanese beer and looked for our notes from last year, which we never found. Super cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That was good fun. So it's time for us to put the camera away and have some beers properly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, here we are. Time to cross the final thing off the bucket list. And that's to see Cherry Blossom. And I actually wasn't even sure if this one was gonna be able to happen because the weather hasn't been great. Plus it's late this year and raining today even. This is our last day here and if it wasn't today, it wasn't gonna happen. So as we reflect on the trip, it's been an amazing few weeks. What's your highlight? There's been so much. Right? I'm a foodie, so maybe Kitakata ramen was pretty good or the yeah. Kobe beef. What yeah, about Kobe you? Beef. I think Fukushima, walking around those, the abandoned, around the, the completely abandoned towns. It was a really surreal experience. And yeah, it was crazy. Super cool. Good food. So much good food. You can't get a bad meal in Japan, I think. We didn't get one, right? No one. My my favorite ramen was the Tokyo place. Oh yeah, yeah, that little spot. Yeah. You sit in in the little room. Yeah. Yeah, sick. In the little room. In the little room. So we didn't get through everything on the list. Three things I wasn't able to do, but. We're coming back, right? Obviously coming back. Obviously. I'm sad I'm about to fly back to England. I'm gonna miss yeah. Japan. You're gonna come up with your own bucket list. Next time. Next time. Part two, coming soon. As our trip draws to a close, we took the last couple of days to really soak it in and enjoy our time here. This adventure has been awesome. We made incredible memories, met a ton of amazing people, and tried our best to eat all of the food in the country. But most importantly, we had a wonderful time, just two mates road tripping around Japan. And while we didn't get to see the whole country and complete the entire bucket list, that's no big deal because of course, we'll be back.